Okay, next up we have um, Chloe Locke and David Kochelko. Only David will be presenting today. Uh, they are, um, their presentation is how blockchain supports scholarly research, innovation and publishing stakeholder engagement. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, are, is my audio audioing? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Thanks. Let me pull up a few slides. And I expect you can see what I have displayed here. There we go. Well, great. Uh, good day, everyone. Dave Pachelko here. Uh, as a co-founder of Artifacts and in collaboration with IES Research, I'm very pleased to speak with you today uh, to provide a glimpse of some of the ways blockchain is, is enabled and able to support research, innovation, and publishing, and particularly in ways that can generate stakeholder engagement in, in new, uh, innovative, and valuable ways. So let me begin with a sense of how blockchain generically is relevant for academic institutions. Well, what is blockchain? It is one of the foundational, if not the foundational Web3 technologies. It's very much a decentralized web. And it, its specific values include the ability to create immutable records and establish a chain of custody or provenance, which for one, for anyone trading in fine art, the concept of provenance has existed for, uh, for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Uh, and, and in the area of scientific and scholarly research, the notion of provenance comes into play with blockchain as a foundational technology to secure provenance. It's important to think of the blockchain as, as writing in indelible or invisible ink. It can be secret, but what combines together very powerfully so with that capability is that the creators of research and knowledge, the owners of the information, the, uh, the owners of the data, if you will, that are produced from scientific and scholarly research are in a position uniquely so to determine access and use or control. So there's the double-sided coin there of secrecy or preservation and control over access as well as disclosure. And lastly here in terms of general relevance for academic institutions, distributed ledgers themselves inherently ensure redundancy, reliability and verifiability. In other words, provide a source of trust. Now, blockchain uses for scholarly research, I've highlighted uh, a handful here. There are many others. And I'll talk about a few specifically that Artifacts is engaged in in a, in a few moments. But I'd like to begin with its value and its use case for securing and protecting intellectual property created by faculty, research staff, graduate students, and others. In other words, their research data. And research data here um, in, the, in, the most, uh, in the most basic digital forms where there are no restrictions on type or format uh, of, of data itself. Importantly, blockchain for scholarly research enables an auditable trail of outputs and activities to be established. If you will, the who, what, and when associated with scientific and scholarly findings. We often read and hear a great deal about the lack or the inability to reproduce findings. And one of the advantages of using blockchain services to secure work products is that those can be chained together in ways that create a chain of custody and ensure 
that follow-on researchers are able to access the entire thread of research work products that have preceded them that they may wish to replicate or the following point indicates to verify like when those data and the, the, those uh, information sources are tied together with publications or with grant submissions or with patents. Um, also to, it's a the blockchain for scholarly research is, is a, an incredibly valuable resource for enabling principal investigators and their institutions to comply with data management obligations. Indeed, there are many who use it to gain a competitive advantage. And I can't begin to tell you how many conversations that I've had with researchers who lament the fact that they so often find themselves having completed a research project where there is lack of funds and lack, lack of staff resources remaining in order to comply with those data management obligations. These threads can be established upfront and throughout a research process by employing blockchain solutions. And lastly here, in terms of uh, use cases in the, in the academy, to confirm the accomplishments uh, or for hiring purposes, performance and tenure reviews, committee appointments, and other decisions that are made within the institution. One too far. So what might one look for in thinking about and evaluating and contemplating the use of blockchain-based products or services for your personal use, for your department, for your institution? I've highlighted these five uh, these five items. First, gain an understanding of what the underlying network is. What, what are the member nodes? And who are the validators? Or what organizations operate the nodes and serve as validators? In our case with artifacts, we rely on the Max Planck founded Blocksburg distributed ledger for science. Secondly, What's the application platform that uh, you, you would use to interact with, uh, either to record transactions onto a ledger uh, or to read out and, and make connections and learn of content that's been transacted on a ledger? In our case with Artifacts, we're the party that actually builds those tools and services and interfaces. Thirdly, What's the consensus protocol or process that maintains the ledger? Everyone, of course, um, perhaps has heard more than they want to hear about, uh, about Bitcoin um, and, uh, a bit, and Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies employ the most challenging, the most, uh, the most complex, difficult, as well as energy consumptive methods of establishing uh, consensus and truth. In the case of artifacts, we apply a very lightweight and very uh, uh, and, and de minimis energy consumer uh, in the form of proof of authority, where the, the validators on the Blacksburg blockchain serve as uh, those entities, and they're all research institutions in their own right across the globe, provide a proof of authority. But that's something you, you must understand. And what you choose to employ or prefer to employ is very much a function of uh, the type of content, the type of information, the type of data uh, that is being transacted. Thirdly, well, what are the transactions themselves? that are recorded on the blockchain comprised of? What, what comprises a block? And in artifacts, uh, in the artifacts environment, it's metadata. It's the bibli bibliographic scientific data associated with 
a work uh, with a work product, a data file, who the contributors uh, were, their roles, um, which devices, what types of devices uh, the data may have emanated from. Uh, did it? Did the data come? Uh, did the data uh, come out of the laboratory, out of a dry lab or wet lab environment? What are the physical material characteristics, and such? And then the access controls and cryptographic requirements of the blocks. And in our case, we encrypt with a SHA-256 uh, encryption. Now briefly, the artifact solution for science and scholarship is comprised of Web3 services that our principal components include an immutable data vault and analytics engine uh, that we reveal through user interfaces. And the generic process there involves data collection, analysis and validation, and some payoff. Could be securing provenance, chain of custody, citation recognition for, uh, for reporting negative results or confirmatory results, as well as mitigation actions. We make, we provide a provenance manager for scientists that's, that's a free service that we make available for scientists and scholars to gain some basic exper experience and familiarity with a blockchain-based application, as well as fee-based services for publishers. But what I really wanna focus on in my, in my concluding slide is the drug tracking uh, and reporting system uh, to address adulterated drugs that we're uh, developing in collaboration with the University of Notre Dame. Now, for anyone who, who has followed this topic in, in the news or perhaps even in your, in your own research, substandard and falsified drugs are, are a global issue and a global problem. Uh, and it's pervasive throughout the supply chains. It's true there in Australia. It's true here in the US where I'm based. Um, substandard means the contents are below therapeutic value. Falsified, however, means the contents don't contain any active pharmaceutical ingredients, some of which may be toxic. The World Health Organization has reported that an estimated 200,000 Africans a year die each year from adulterated malaria drugs alone. And Gilead Pharma, uh, just just last week, a maker of HIV medicines reported that over 200, 250,000 doses of its product were found to be fraudulent. So the current uh, system deployed and operated uh, by the Lieberman Lab at the University of Notre Dame, they've named the Distributed Pharma Pharmaceutical Analytical Lab. And they collect drugs from the field they're screen tested in the field. These are prescription generic drugs, I should add. They're screened in the field. Data and the drugs are then forwarded onto South Bend where uh, the Lieberman lab is based. And they act as control central over a, a large group of affiliated testing labs that perform uh, high performance liquid chromatography as assays on those drugs. The reports are compiled by the Lieber Lieberman lab and then reported to the various stakeholders, typically the national drug regulators, if you will, the national uh, 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 FDAs in the respective countries. And they're collecting these drugs and they've been doing so for the past five, six years from across Africa and Asia, East Asia. The problems in this research project, although research certainly confirms the public health crisis that I alluded to earlier. The problem that they've, problems they've run into are the data are not secured, they can't be verified, there's no chain of custody, and it's a manually intensive process that just doesn't scale. So the solution that we're building together and currently pilot testing is one that will support massive expansion of testing of drug types and across countries. APIs will be screened in the field, data captured, uh, both on laptops, digital and, uh, and uh, uh, digital devices, if you will, uh, phones, cell phones. The drugs will be routed uh, to HPLC labs for further analysis as they currently are, but every step of the way along this workflow, all the way through to making the findings actionable 
for stakeholders in the field, every step and every data element will be uh, immutably recorded and chained together in a chain of custody. So what we're providing is a cloud-based application that integrates with the Blacksburg blockchain where all activity, data and actors, and locations are encrypted and recorded, providing a permanent immutable chain of custody and reporting for regulatory agencies, manufacturers, distributors, pharmacies, and NGOs, all of whom have important parts to play in improving the overall, overall quality of our pharmaceutical supply chain. So with that, let me conclude my remarks. And uh, if there is time allowing, open this up for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, I've seen that uh, one of the um, webinar participants has raised their hand. Graham, if you could put your question into the um, Padlet, um, then we can ask that question of David. There are a, a couple of questions in the Padlet already. Um, so I'll just run through a few of those. Um, what advantage does blockchain have for this use case beyond what you'd get from a database with solid encryption and cryptographic signatures? Can it make up for the disadvantages of using blockchain, such as high entry barrier and extreme computational and um, electricity use usage? Well, uh, it's a great question. And uh, I'll go back to the point I made earlier about, a pr about proof of authority. Uh, the computational requirements of the platform that we're operating um, are extremely low. They're negligible. Um, this, is not, uh, this is not a Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. Um, it doesn't require uh, that, that level of computational uh, service in order to support it. We're not exchanging financial uh, financial uh, assets whatsoever. Um, so the, appli the application uh, can and and the Blocksburg blockchain itself runs on servers, contemporary conventional servers that are sitting across uh, its uh, 40 institutional member node. It's a very low computational or energy consumptive requirement. Great, thank you. Um, do you see artifact services as an alternative or complement to efforts in applying persistent identifiers to research objects, such as data site DOIs being applied to instruments? Um, I very much see artifacts as, as a complement. Um, uh, we are not at all uh, seeking to replace or supplant DOIs or other persistent identifiers that are used in, in the scholarly ecosystem. Indeed, um, what our system is engineered to do is to facilitate, um, for example, if you and I were collaborating uh, on, on a research project and generating various outputs, uh, we could use the system to uh, obtain DOIs um, or, or other persistent identifiers for all of our work products that we had secured using the artifacts platform if and when or at the appropriate time when we chose uh, to seek those identifiers for purposes of publishing or sharing that information more broadly with the scholarly community. So we see ourselves directly as a, very much so as a complement. Great, thank you very much for your time, David.